This is the House of Hockey podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network. Hockey is more than a game, it's a lifestyle. It's you, the diehard supportive fans, your favorite players who are on the team you cheer for and the organization who supports them. The companies that make your gear, bags, and beer league sweaters, the hockey moms and hockey dads, and everything else that makes this House of Hockey your home. Come on in, I'm Breezy. And I'm Ray Ray. And And this this is is our house. house. DraftKings Sportsbook is not only our favorite sportsbook, but also America's top rated sportsbook. We love using DraftKings Sportsbook. It is easy to navigate, has plenty of instructions for you new bettors, and nearly limitless ways to get in on all the action. My friends and family have been loving DraftKings Sportsbook, and I know you will too. Listen to this great offer. DraftKings Sportsbook is putting you courtside with a chance to turn $1 into $100 in site credits. That's right. Pick any basketball team that is still in contention, bet $1, and if that team wins, you win $100 in site credits. Don't forget, DraftKings Sportsbook also offers great odds and promotions on baseball, hockey, and so much more all week long. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code THPN when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 in free credits. Bet on the basketball team of your choice to win their next game, and if they do, you'll claim $100 in free credits. That's promo code THPN for the Hockey Podcast Network for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Wager paid out in site credits. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. What's up, everybody? You are listening to the House of Hockey podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Breezy. And I'm your other host, Ray Ray. This is episode, what, 65, 65. we said? Yes. Yeah, 65. Yes. How are you feeling? 65. That's a a big number. You know, I I think I had a dream. I was dreaming about this, but I don't know. I I was dreaming we were at like 165 episodes. And I was like, how is that possible? We've only been doing this for like a year, almost a year and a half. But uh, I I think that means good things are coming. Yes. You know, we're going to be doing 165 episodes. (laughs) (laughs) I am... I am doing well. I love our episode this week. Uh, I think it's super fitting considering last week I was in Pittsburgh and ran into Selena Pompiani, which you all already know from listening to last week's episode. But we have the play-by-play TV broadcaster for the Penguins, Steve Mears, a.k.a. Mearsy, on the episode. And he tells us all about everything penguins and as well as his broadcasting career yeah and he's been pretty much everywhere he you know lived in mass or uh in new york working for the nhl network i believe he called some games for uh the rangers the islanders uh again he's done outdoor games he's done uh, all-star games he's done i think he even did the u.s open didn't he yeah i'm pretty sure he did he got to do that uh so some really unique things yeah so steve is awesome uh he shared some great stories with us obviously there's a good sid story in here um (laughs) so stay tuned for that later yes in the meantime (gasps) can i start with a shut the front door go for it i feel like i know where this one's going yes you do because i posted about (laughs) it because i was aghast, I think is the right word to describe it, shut the front door that during game four of the Bruins Islanders series, Boston Bruins forward David Krejci frickin jabbed my boy Matt Barzal in the gonads with a hockey stick 
and has officially been fined $5,000, the maximum allowable for slashing. Uh, and he served a minor penalty, he served two minutes for it. But how dare he, how dare he do that to my ultimate hockey hunk, Matt Barsal? That's, that's not nice. No. In, in the family jewels. I know. How, what if he wants, what if Barzal wants to procreate and make beautiful children with somebody with that jawline? I mean, come on. And the, and the hair. And the hair. And the hair. <laughs> oh, I got to say, though, he, Barzal played a really tough game. I mean, they, the Bruins were all over him and just, he did not give up. He scored the goal that really, you know, put them in the lead and set them up to win game four. That series has really been fun to watch because they're playing like old time hockey, those teams where there's so much like physicalness and checking and it's, it's fast and it's fun. And you, there's a shot on goal. It feels like every play and you're just like, (gasps) and just hearing the fans in both barns through the TV is, I mean, I was thinking to myself, is it just me or are the Islander fans really that loud? Two, have we just gone so long without hearing natural fan sound through the broadcast because of COVID? Um, But either way, I'm like here for it and I am loving (laughs) watching the playoffs. Yeah, it's awesome. I haven't, I think I only watched one of their games. But I, I just haven't really even watched any playoff hockey uh, in the last couple days. But the Avs and the Knights yeah. games have been nutty. No pun intended there, but like actual <laughs> nutty. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. It's it, playoff hockey at its best. Also, I'm sorry, but I'm going to I'm going to turn the knife because I can the Canadians are up to to nothing on the Jets. Like, what? What is happening? I just, I'm, I'm very excited for this. I, I'm, I'm living for every single game. I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. I do have a, a small confession to make. Um, I, I probably shouldn't be very proud of this decision that I made. Uh, but to be fair, I, I had a few uh, beverages that night. <laughs> And I just, you know, I was just all up in my feelings. And I may have purchased a uh, Tyler Toffoli Canadians jersey. <laughs> you know what? I support that. And I'm not going to give you, you hell for any of that because I know you have always been a fan of him. He was a king. Yeah. I don't know what Leafs fans would say about you wearing a Canadian's jersey, like just in general. So I would say I don't know if I would necessarily wear it, (laughs) but it's more of like a uh, I actually have a signed Tyler Foley jersey on my wall. It's a Kings jersey, but it would be cool. I just really love the uh, the Habs, like just their away jersey, the white with the red. And I think that his number, I don't know, there's just something about like his name and number on that jersey that just strikes me. And I was like, I feel like I need this just in my collection. Okay. Just in my collection. I'm not necessarily probably going to wear it, uh, but I, I did get one. Um, Tyler, if you ever hear this, you're welcome. I support you. <laughs> she does. Um, I'm yeah. not going to give you hell for it because I have a feeling enough people listening and fans uh, that our Leafs fans will probably have a lot to say to you, so I'll just probably. let them. I'll just let them handle that. That's okay. That's okay. But also, there's this new guy on TikTok that he is taking TikTok by storm. His name he goes by Whitey. He's like full on like '80s style, and he's a he's a Canadians fan. He just has like '80s love songs that he just kind of like lip syncs. Like, he has, like, over a million followers, and they're all just basically, like, cougars at this point. Guy lives in Toronto, and I'm just like, Whitey, you're my boy. I will, I'm going to send you him, because you're going to be like, oh, he's got, like, a little, like, mullet thing going on, but, like, he rocks it. All right. I'm going to send it to you. All right. You, you, your recommendations are always strong, so... And you know my level of capacity for bullshit. So like. Yes. It's just but it just makes you happy, honestly. You just you're like, Whitey, what's what song you got today? And like he just it. his like 
10 second clip you're like okay that just made my day i could we could all use a little bit of that in our life exactly for sure exactly so i'll send it to you okay we have to talk about one other thing and then i want you to get to your unexplained things story that you have so taya curry is the first female hockey player who's ever been drafted to the ontario hockey league the ohl if you don't know is one of three major junior ice hockey leagues um and it's for players that are 16 to 21 years of age and if she plays, she won't be el- if she plays in the OHL, she won't be eligible to play in the NCAA. Um, but this is huge progress. I think this is a great example to put double middle fingers up to those people who say that like women have to play in women's leagues because it's uh, unfair or it's not balanced play. I mean, this is proof and like they drafted her because of her skill not because she's a woman and yeah that's awesome it's good to be uh to be judged off of your skill not your your gender because in this sport um if you have a passion for it and if you are skilled at it and you play well uh that's pretty much all that should matter so and we've talked to enough women hockey players on this show who've all told us that they all started out playing against the men, you know, or playing on teams with men, and that, you know, they've had their challenges with that, but then it didn't matter. Like, it, it wasn't like a thing, right? It was just, there There aren't places for really skilled, talented women to play because the women's sport is still being grown and brought up. And so if you're trying to play competitively, the next step is to go to a men's league where men yeah. play. So it's, you know, a whole thing. But uh, yeah. congratulations to Taya Curry, the OHL, for allowing this and making this happen. Either way, I think it's it's great for the sport in general and that's my thought on that that's the thought tell me your unexplained things story so this happened on uh this past friday my nephew my oldest nephew comes over every friday we've talked about this before and he went to go leave so i was like walking him out he stopped turned around and we always just do like this little like fist bump thing and as he did that, his car is parked across the street. So as he did that, this weird sound happened. It was loud. It almost sounded like a sonic boom, but like a lower decibel. Was that the right word? Mm-hmm. It sounded like something was breaking the sound barrier. But again, it wasn't like to the point where like it hurt my head. It was just like, that was like a weird, like, and it came from the direction that my friend took the picture or the video of all the lights uh-huh. and i remember going like that is so weird now we do have a freeway that runs up or a highway where freeways over here um semi trucks go all the time my mom was like what well, kind of sounded like you know like a truck backfiring and we're like i don't know like that was weird like it didn't sound like it came from the freeway and he got into the his car he's like okay i'm not taking the back roads i don't know what's over there i'm taking the freeway and so he gets into his car and he's plugging his phone in and he's uh texting his girlfriend that he's leaving my house and he's driving home just because he's safe like that and it happens again same sound but not as loud but like maybe it was that the original sound was a 10 this was probably like a nine okay happens again so I walk across the street and he's like, is everything okay? And I said, the sound happened again. He goes, that's it. I'm convinced, <laughs> convinced. And I was like, well, just drive careful. Let me know when you get home. So he drives away. The sound happens again. And this time it was probably like a seven. Whoa. That's not a truck. It's not a truck because if it was a truck, it would be gone by then. And why mm-hmm. would it still be that loud? No. No. No, 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 no. Unless they're, no, no. No. That's an unexplained thing for sure. Yeah. I agree with you. So I was just like, hmm, this is weird. This is strange. Girl, weird stuff happens where you live. Weird stuff does happen where I live. (laughs) I blame it on Rockadine. It's right here. (laughs) 
<laughs> this week we have Steve Mears on the podcast. He has been the play-by-play broadcaster of the Penguins on AT&T Sportsnet since the beginning of the 2017-2018 season. Prior to this, he spent five seasons with the NHL Network, which included serving as host of NHL Live, NHL Now, and a play-by-play announcer for the World Juniors Hockey Championship and NHL International. Steve is a Pittsburgh native, and he bleeds black and gold. Enjoy our chat with our quote-unquote Yinzer. I do television play-by-play for the Pittsburgh Penguins on AT&T Sportsnet Pittsburgh here in Pittsburgh, PA, which is my hometown Grew up a Penguin fan, a Pittsburgh sports fan. So I've been around a bunch of different places in the NHL and in uh, minor league hockey, college hockey, but very happy to and very fortunate to be calling the games for my hometown team here and uh, a team that has had a lot of success over the last 30 years with uh, five Stanley Cups and a host of amazing and uh, gifted offensive players. So uh, we've been really lucky here. Is that this is one of the best hockey towns, if you ask me, in uh, all of North America. So, Steve, how did you get into broadcasting and specifically, you know, play-by-play? Was this something you always wanted to do? How did you end up in this field? Yeah, well, since I was 10 years old, this is all I wanted to do. And specifically, all I wanted to be was the announcer for the Penguins. So the odds of that happening were really slim. I mean, it's ridiculous when you stop and think about it and, you turn around and look back at the path to to get to this point but i've been really lucky got some breaks along the way as anybody does in this business if they make it this far and uh i think really the goal in reality was just to be involved in the nhl in some way i, I thought it was such a far-fetched goal to want to be the announcer for the penguins but just to be in the nhl world in some capacity it didn't matter if it was zamboni driver or play-by-play guy or <laughs> equipment manager it, it did not matter one bit no so it I matters a little bit come on a little well, bit you didn't really kid, want though, to drive a zamboni well what, but when you're a kid though you just when you're walking into that building and i see it so vividly here to this day i mean it's 1991 all over again and when you walk in you just want to be immersed in it in any way possible and then obviously as you get older those things kind of get chiseled a little bit more and you realize that this is a career where you can do for a long time and you're not good enough to be a player so maybe a play-by-play guy is the best route to the nhl and you get in for free and you get to bring the game to the people on radio or tv so uh as i got into high school and college i realized that uh that was the dream job and i took the steps necessary to try to fulfill that dream yeah and you've been doing a super awesome job i mean you just said you you know announced the uh nhl games you've done outdoor games you've done uh all-star games and you've obviously done stanley cup final what's it like doing all of those different things and are they super similar are they all different i think they're they're different you know, all the events they have their own magnitude they have their own storyline and you have a different approach every single time the way i call a game as the hometown announcer for the local hockey team is different than the way that I called the world juniors to a national audience or a Stanley Cup final for an international audience. I think they're all very different. Um, clear, And I don't apologize for my homerism for the Penguins. I mean, here I am wearing a pirate shirt just by coincidence. And uh, I do not apologize one bit because it's in my DNA, just having grown up here. Uh, but you obviously want to have some objectivity and you want to do a good job and you want to respect the other team. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was that never forget there are two teams. It takes two teams to play this game from uh, the great Jiggs McDonald taught me that before I, I did my first NHL game. It takes two teams to play this game. So uh, basically don't be that much of a homer, but it is in my DNA and I love being a part of the city and I love being from here and knowing the history of the teams. But so it's, it's different when you're the local announcer and you're slanted one way to a certain percentage. It's definitely different than when you're calling a game uh, on a national level and then you want to be right down the middle. Do you have a favorite call you've made in across your 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 career thus far or a memorable uh, one or something funny that happened or historic? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I was lucky enough on the international side to call two Stanley Cups for the Penguins, the back-to-back wins in 2016 and 2017. So uh, those I'll always remember just because like to be there and to be in the arena when the cup is raised yeah. 
was such a thrill and it was the Penguins winning it and back to back that hadn't happened in almost two decades so uh, that was really special and then a bunch of uh, World Junior events Team USA winning gold in 2013 and 2017 uh, that those were really amazing because all those players almost all of them have graduated to the NHL so 2013 Seth Jones and Jacob Truba and Johnny Gaudreau and JT Miller they are all now legitimate NHL players and we got to see them at such a young age and winning gold for Team USA and then the same thing in 2017 with Charlie McAvoy and Luke Cunning and a bunch of other great players Clayton Keller who won in that tournament as well we were doing those games for NHL Network so uh it's, I've been really lucky just getting to do different events, different levels, um, and to see the players progress over the years. And even in college, like it, it's scary now to think that some of the guys I saw in college are now retired. So that's how <laughs> you know you're really getting old. But also, it is, like you said, a career that you can have for a lot longer than actually playing hockey. That's a positive there. Tell us yeah. about your start um, in calling hockey with the mud bugs in Bossier City, Louisiana, because we have talked about just sort of the history of hockey in Louisiana, Louisiana here on the podcast um, and with a guest who lives there who's a big hockey fan. So we've heard the history, but from your perspective, what was it like? Uh, what are the fans like? How is it, you know, I guess you could offer a comparison to Pittsburgh. I know it's a different level of play, but just that whole experience and the fandom in Louisiana, what was that like? Yeah, there's a similarity in just the passion for the sport. And a lot of people, maybe some casual hockey fans, may not realize that uh, you have diehard, very knowledgeable fans in that part of the country. And there's a rich history of minor league hockey down there. And it's starting to get youth hockey going in a little bit more and starting to get some players who have been able to graduate, play down there and graduate on to uh, whether it's like some level of college hockey or junior hockey. So uh, very, very fun. I always say like those four years are the most fun of my life because everything about it was fun. It was like getting your master's in hockey where you're learning every single aspect about the business side of the game. And a lot of the people that I was working with down there are still lifelong friends, the GM, the coach, some of the players that you'll keep in touch with regularly. Uh, so it was great. The fans were unbelievable. And some of the things that happened, this would have been 15 years ago, some of the things that happened, if you told somebody that they actually happened, they'd never believe it. And they thought, would think it was like out of slap shot in the 1970s, like line brawls and the things that happened on the bus on a 20 hour bus ride and coaches getting into a fight on the ice in their suits. I mean, these things you would you think like, there's no way that happened at any time period other than the 70s slap shot era broad street bullies but no it happened like 15 20 years ago in the old chl and there was something to that where you had some tough customers with 400 penalty minutes that were just out there to make their presence felt and uh and made a pretty good living out of it although a tough living and I'd like to think that the state of minor league hockey has graduated to a little bit more skill and a little bit less of that. But uh, see, I, those memories, though, I'll never forget. And uh, someday I can write a book and tell some of those stories about just all the things that happened that uh, you would never th think would ever possibly think it would happen in, uh, in this century. Can you give us yeah. a, a, a little a little snippet of a story that's appropriate? That's not going to get anybody in trouble. <laughs> Well, the, the coach is fighting, and that one always goes that immediately. I think of that as like minor league hockey in a nutshell. In their suits at the Kansas Coliseum in Wichita, Kansas, after a playoff game, and the building's packed, it's 8,000 fans, mud bugs against the Wichita Thunder, and something happened at the end, and the mud bugs had to cross the path of the Wichita Thunder to get to their locker room, which is just a powder keg waiting to happen and an explosion. And sure enough, the coaches exchange words. And then before I know it, as I'm wrapping up to get to the post-game show, they're throwing punches in their suits on the ice. And, of course, dress shoes and ice, not the best combination, especially when you're trying to get a grip and, and uh, throw some haymakers out there. But it was just like, what world am I living in that this is happening right now? And we can all laugh about it. Nobody got hurt. And uh, there were fines and suspensions, as there should have been. But it's just like, uh, wow, this is the minor league life, and this stuff really happens. Uh, it was pretty crazy to think about. That is hilarious. Well, I want to bring you back to uh, to calling the Stanley Cup final real quick. When What goes through your head 
you know, waking up that morning thinking, man, I could be, you know, calling the Stanley Cup, like the game, like the game winning goal right now. What kind of, is there any other prep that you have to do or extra prep? I mean, how, describe what it is like for you going into your job on a day like that. Well, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier, that you're just thankful that you get in for free. I mean, as a kid, I would have paid <laughs> any amount of money to get into those games. And to any time you get to see the cup raised in person, it doesn't matter what your role is. I have roles as a reporter for the winning team, the losing team. I was hosting shows there for NHL Network. And then for four straight years, I got to do the, the actual games of the play-by-play, -play, the international broadcast. So uh, you're just happy to be there because you know it's a big event. No matter what happens, you can be a 10 up and blow out. No matter what happens, it's going to be a memorable game because it's the Stanley Cup final. And uh, in, in the case of doing the two Penguin games, it was special personally because it's the Penguins, my hometown team, and they're winning the Cup. Uh, they're about to. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, nerves and excitement and one of the things the last one i did was uh two years ago in uh boston game seven the blues and the bruins and one of the things i did was i texted my idol mike lang the hall of fame voice of the penguins for 45 years and he's always been such a great uh mentor to me and anytime i have a question i can go to him so i texted him before the game i remember doing that in the hotel and i just said uh, any advice because there have only been, I think, 13 Game 7s for Stanley Cups in history. I mean, it's something like that. It's not a very high number for a league that's been around for 100 years. And he's done one of them. He did it in 2009 on Penguins Radio oh, in Detroit with the Penguins and the Red Wings. And Nick Lidstrom being stopped by Marc-Andre Fleury in the final seconds. And, and Mike had one of his iconic, one of his many iconic calls. So I texted him and just asked if you have any advice and uh, who better to talk to than the guy who's seen it all in his 45 years is one of the greatest voices of all time in uh, sports broadcasting history. And his advice was just treat it like any other game. You prepare exactly the same way. You have the exact same approach and the game will probably take care of itself. And that was the case. The Blues won. It was their first ever Stanley Cup. It was an incredible hockey game. And, uh, and I think just the, the preparation was – the exact same as a Tuesday night between Ottawa and Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh in November, where uh, no matter what, you never know what you're going to see. That's the beauty of this job. And you never know what you're going to see on any given night. So that game in November in Ottawa, that could be one of the great regular season games in NHL history, or someone could have some feet that you've never seen before. A guy could score five goals. So uh, the preparation, I think is the biggest thing. And in any case, no matter how big or small the game is, it has to stay the same because you have to be prepared in this job. You have to be prepared for anything. Clearly everything. If you get coaches that could potentially be fighting. <laughs> That's right. I don't know what my call is was for that, but uh, I'm sure, I'm sure I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> but you are now. Oh my gosh. That's right. If it happens in the NHL, I will be ready to go and I will have the best coach on coach brawl call that you could ever have. The bar is high on those coach bench clearing brawl calls, Steve. Yeah. Oh, I, well, it's kind of disturbing to hear that that still happens, but uh, it's, it's just part of me. It's like, it, there's something that's so almost charming about it. And you, now, of course, the first thing is you don't want anybody to get hurt. But um, I, I would, again, like to think that we've moved on to uh, more skill and speed. And I know in the NHL, they certainly have getting away from fighting in general, although it still happens and it still happens. I know in, in beer league, stupidly, it happens in beer league and it happens in junior hockey. And they're trying to get rid of it. And this game is so much more than that, that aspect of it. But it is a part of the history. There's no question about it. It is. But tell us a little bit more about your experience coming in then to be the play-by-play -play for your hometown team and then also having, you know, replacing, not replacing, that's not the right word, but taking the place of Paul Stegerwald and like him, you know, being in there for decades. How, how did you process that? How did the fans receive you? You know, what was that whole experience like? Because that's like crazy. That's like, I mean, if you were a baseball fan and you're replacing Harry Carey, it's like one of these things where it's like, how do you even, one, process that? And especially two, because you're a fan of the team yourself and having grown up with them, you know, what is that process like? 
Well, it was a difficult decision because at the time I was living in New York and working for NHL Network and was very happy. I was living in Manhattan at uh, a great five years there where you got to sit in the chair that was covering every single hockey event, every trade, every big game. We were at all the big events. So for a hockey fan like myself, that was a dream seat to be sitting in. And uh, one day you get the call that uh, there's an opening and uh, asking if I would be interested. And I think in my heart, ultimately, the goal was to get back to play by play in some fashion. Like that's my first love in this business, as much as I love hosting and interviewing and reporting and doing all the different roles that uh, this broadcasting profession has to offer. My first and true love is play by play. So uh, anytime any NHL play by play job comes open, you have to at least inquire about it because they don't open up that often. And there aren't that many teams. There's only 31 now to be for the 32 teams. So uh, you have to keep an eye on it. And I always did. And uh, the, the thought that it could be the Penguins, I mean, that just uh, the fact that it was the Penguins just put it over the top. If, if it had been any other team, almost any other team, I probably would have stayed in New York and been very happy there and working for NHL Network and MLB Network at the time. They had merged. So I was doing some baseball, too. And and that was great. But uh, to be here at Pittsburgh and and not just the hometown connection, but the fact that it is a top tier sports franchise. It's one of the best franchises in the world uh, and certainly in hockey as far as the fan base, the ownership, the building, the, uh, the quality of the players, the history of the team. And it's one of the best run organizations in all of sports. So uh, that was appealing as well. And, and the people at the network, AT&T Sportsnet Pittsburgh, they do a phenomenal job with the product they put out there on the airwaves. So uh, when you added up all those factors, uh, it turned out to be somewhat of an easy decision, but it did take some contemplating. And uh, and I definitely miss my time, all the people at, uh, at NHL Network that I work with. A lot of them are still there and it's wonderful people. I had five great years with EJ Raddick, and he and I were, we for the majority of that time, did a show together for two hours. And uh, he's still one of my best friends. And, and uh, I just look back so fondly on that time at NHL Network. How is your relationship with the fan with Penguins fans now? I mean, do you have any sort of interaction with them? Have any of them asked you to announce anything weird off the ice on the streets or anything like that? I think I've gotten a few of those requests. I don't know if I've taken up any of them, but uh, <laughs> that's uh, I'm lucky because in, in in normal circumstances, I sit in the stands at PPG Paints Arena. I'm not up on the seventh floor press box. I'm right there in the lower bowl. It's a better vantage point right there at center ice, right in the middle of a packed arena. And one of the benefits, one of the many benefits of that is that uh, before the game and after the game, I get to see a lot of fans who are coming through and saying hi and talking, wanting pictures and, and I uh, just want to talk about the game. And I love doing that. Some of them they'll come up and they'll be like, uh, well, I know the last thing you want to do is talk hockey after you just talk hockey for two and a half hours. But, the fact is, I love talking hockey. I love doing it right this second. I love talking hockey at any point. It's not a boring subject. It's not something that uh, I think uh, is like pulling teeth. It's a, it's a fun subject. It's something we all love. It's a sport we all love. So uh, I never have any trouble if people uh, want to talk hockey, whether it's at the grocery store or at the arena after the game. I really enjoy it. And uh, like most people are almost apologetic, but I I just say, yeah, well, what did you think of the game? What did you think of that play? Well, that was a great play by Crosby, wasn't it? You know, so uh, I love having those conversations. And you, and you realize that those fans are the lifeblood of this sport. And they are the reason why you have a job. And if it wasn't for them, then this job would be rather pointless. So uh, we're lucky. We have uh, the best red ratings in the league, the highest ratings. We have the best fan base uh, with the ratings just came out and uh, the Penguin fans, they're, they're number one. They, they watch these games religiously and uh, I always appreciate the, the fan support. So all the interactions I've had have been uh, have just been incredible. And I think a lot of them appreciate the fact that I'm a quote unquote Yinzer, as we say here in Pittsburgh. And uh, and uh, they know that uh, that I care about the city and I care about the team. And I think that uh, hopefully comes through on the broadcast. Well, speaking of talking hockey, talk a little hockey to us about this season What's your take? What were the strengths, weaknesses of the team? And what do you see for them coming next season? Well, regular season wise, it was a fantastic year. A lot of people had the Penguins missing the playoffs. If you go back to some of the uh, prognostications prior to this year, and uh, people thought the Penguins were on the 
the downhill uh, slide. They didn't have quite as strong of a supporting cast as they've had in the Stanley Cup years. And they end up winning the East Division. And it was a tough division with Washington and Boston added in the mix and, and an upcoming Rangers team. And the Islanders are always tough. So uh, the, the competition in the East was difficult. And the Penguins won the division in the face of a lot of adversity with a ton of injuries, especially on defense early on in the year. And you had some standout performers like Sidney Crosby, top 10 score in the league. Jake Gensel during the regular season had a great year. 20 goals, Brian Russ, 20 goals, Chris Letang had one of his best seasons ever. And then in the playoffs, the pesky New York Islanders, who have just been a thorn in the side of the Penguins historically, they do it again. And uh, unfortunately, the biggest issue in the playoff series was the goaltending. And Tristan Jari struggled after he had a great regular season, but struggled in the playoffs. And that ended up being the difference. It wasn't just on him, but that was the big factor that the Islanders got the big saves at, at key times and the Penguins didn't. And as we see in the Stanley Cup playoffs now, just look at the players who are left, the, the high-priced goaltenders who are remaining, whether it's Carey Price or Connor Hellebuck or Andre Vasilevsky or Tuka Rath. If you don't have goaltending in this game, you're not going anywhere. So uh, the Islanders got some huge games from Ilya Sorokin and the Penguins struggled in goal. And I think that's just... Uh, the way it goes in this sport, and especially at this time of year, there's so much scrutiny on the goaltenders. And Tristan Jari's a young netminder. He's 26, but for a goaltender, and especially experience-wise, he's young. And I think uh, it, hopefully it's a learning experience for him, and he'll be able to bounce back. What do you think for upcoming season? And, like, we've got the expansion draft happening with Seattle, and, I mean, you are very familiar with the – um, extra emotional things that come with that with uh, Andre Fleury and the Vegas Golden Knights when they entered the league. So how uh, how do you think all of that can positively impact the Penguins for the next season? Yeah, well, I think the given for the most likely scenario is that they're going to lose a pretty good player. And, and Ron Hextall, their general manager, has said that. That's the way it goes. And the rules are set up just as they were for the Vegas Golden Knights for the Seattle Kraken to be a good team right out of the gate. The league made it very clear. They did not want the usual 90s-style team coming in where they struggle for 10 years and they're a bottom feeder and uh, you know, the, easily the novelty wears off and then eventually it just it may not even work, like in the case of the Atlanta Thrashers, for example. So um, they wanted those teams, Vegas and Seattle, to be good and to be at least – playoff contenders and Vegas goes to the Stanley Cup final their first year There'd be a lot of pressure on Seattle to do something similar but they will get a very good lineup that they'll be able to field uh, on opening night and for the Penguins I, I think uh, they'll have to try to be creative and who they protect and that's a big question and but I think under any circumstance you're probably going to lose a good player uh, but it's uh, that's the way the rules are set right now and I think for the Penguins moving forward to ne into next year, they've made it very clear. They still believe this team can contend for a Stanley Cup. I think had they gotten some better goaltending, they could have gone on a run this year. And they made it very clear they want to keep this core intact, which is Sidney Crosby, Chris Letang, and Evgeny Malkin. They still feel that this team has at least another good run left in them. And I, I believe that. If you look at the years they had, including Malkin, who was hurt, of course, at the end of the year, but... He was fantastic prior to his injury. He had 12 points in eight games. He just hit his stride, and then he gets hurt, and it really uh, took him out for the rest of the year for the most part. But even in the playoffs, injured, he was pretty solid, uh, basically on one leg. And now we know he's uh, subsequently had knee surgery. So uh, when you look at the, the seasons that Crosby, Latang, and Malkin all had, I thought they were very, very good. And uh, I would still take that core if they can get the right – supporting cast around them who knows maybe they can go on a run next year well let's hope it right i mean i think penguins hockey is probably one of the most entertaining uh teams you could watch especially in the in the playoffs because i feel like a lot of i mean pittsburgh in general i think gets a lot of hate towards their team maybe hates like the wrong word to say but they're uh they're pesky to a lot of other other teams and other cities and whatnot and I think that just adds more fuel to their fire and they could be, you know, a little sleepish throughout the season sometimes, 
But then when the playoffs come, it's like they hit you straight in the face. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's such a great fan base here in Pittsburgh, and uh, and I think the the building blocks are in place for the Penguins, and it starts with a coach, right, and to instill that playing style. And uh, they were fun, though. They were absolutely fun to watch. They have been now this style of play for decades, going back to Lemieux and Yager. And, and uh, Penguins hockey is offensive hockey. It's not the New Jersey Devils of the 90s or the New York Islanders of today where it's uh, focused on defense. The Penguins want to play fast. They want to play physical. They want to play an offensive brand. They've had a ridiculous amount of league scoring champions. I mean, you look at one point, they had 15 scoring titles in 30 years between Lemieux, Yager, Malkin, and Crosby. There are franchises like the Flyers that have never had a scoring champion in 50 plus years. So uh, we've been unbelievably blessed here. And I think because of those offensive players, and now one of them, of course, is the owner of the team in Mario Lemieux, I think we've been really lucky. And uh, not just from the on ice product and the Stanley Cups, but just the entertainment value mm-hmm. And it's just that's the that's the hockey I want to watch. Is, uh, I'll take a, I always say I'll take a six five game any day of the week. And I know the coaches don't like it, but I'll take that that and an eight seven six five. And those are the most entertaining games for me. And uh, luckily here at the Stanley Cup playoffs, you're seeing some of that brand, like with the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Colorado Avalanche and the Vegas Golden Knights. It's fast. It's offensive. They're trading chances, and I think that's hockey at its best. Yes. All right. We're gonna hit you with our final four questions. So you can get to uh, get your skates sharpened and yeah. baked because it's time for you to get back out on the ice. They're uh, brand new. They've been waiting and collecting dust. So I'm looking forward to uh, to getting on the ice today. I'm not looking forward to the day tomorrow when I wake up and that will be a, a very, very sore morning. Yeah, that'll be a slow, <laughs> slow get out of bed kind of day. Yes. Uh, Okay, we ask every single guest these questions. Um, they're meant to just be fun and uh, entertaining. Who is your ultimate hockey hunk? Hockey hunk? Oh, I, uh, I, I think <laughs> you go to uh, the hair, right? That's the, everyone goes like Henrik Lundqvist's hair. That's like the, the if anybody could have the hair of Henrik Lundqvist, I think you would obviously go in that direction. As you can see, I could uh, I could use it. So uh, I think anybody would go for the vote for uh, Lundqvist and his fashion sense, of course. I mean, he's good in GQ. So uh, I think Henrik Lundqvist, and we hope he comes back too. I mean, that's uh, it would really would have been nice to see him uh, play for Washington. Maybe they could have gone on a run if he had mm-hmm. been back. But uh, I'll go with Lundqvist, just uh, the fashion sense and the hair. And who is your favorite hockey lady? It could be skater, broadcaster, wife, girlfriend, uh, front office, anybody. Well, my fiance is a big hockey fan and also a Penguin fan. So uh, I would have to put her at number one. But um, I think uh, with with the job at NHL Network, we got an opportunity to speak with uh, some of the great women's players of all time, really. We had Hillary Knight on the show. We had Megan Duggan, captain of Team USA. We had uh, Kendall Point Schofield, Lamaru Twins. I mean, we talked to so many members of Team USA, among other great players, not just Americans, but some of the great Canadians. And uh, But anytime you got to talk to Hillary Knight, I mean, she's one of the great American players of all time, or Angela Ruggiero. Uh, I think uh, you could just go on and on. Uh, Megan Duggan always, she, she came in studio and, and Hillary Knight did as well. And uh, just to talk hockey with her and to know what a great leader she is and was with Team USA. And now she's moved on and is part of the New Jersey Devils uh, player development hockey operations staff, which is fantastic. So uh, I always had a fondness for those players. And when they went on and played in the various Olympic games. It just gave me such a greater rooting interest because you got to know them personally. So uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Megan Duggan. and I think her future is really bright in, uh, in the sport. I agree, I agree. Well, it's only uh, right to ask you this question uh, and it is a part of our final three. Do you have, or what is your best or most memorable Sidney Crosby story? Uh, well, we were re- reminiscing quite a bit because uh, he had the 1,000th game earlier this year, so there were a lot of uh, discussions about 
looking back on the last 16 years and you could just go on and on. And I always say he's as advertised. There's nothing fake. Uh, there's no facade for the cameras. Uh, everything about him is as advertised. He's just as polite and charitable and uh, as good a leader as you see in the interviews. Uh, but one thing that really stands out, I remember it was about two or three maybe years ago, we were in Toronto and are outside the Penguins Hotel, especially in Toronto, there's always a large crowd of autograph seekers and the guy that they want for their autographs, mostly Sidney Crosby among the other star players that we have, but they're waiting for Crosby patiently outside this hotel in the parking lot. And he usually obliges and signs some, he can't sign them all, but he uh, he signs whatever he can. And then eventually we got to get on the bus and get to the arena because it's 4.30 and you got to get to the game. But uh, the bus, everyone got on, he had done his thing, went down the row, signed a few, got on the bus, and uh, the bus wheels start to crunch away out of the parking lot. And all of a sudden, the back of the bus, you hear, hey, hold up. And it was him. And he had seen that there was a kid who did not get an autograph that had a jersey. And tell, I'm telling you, there is no one that can stop that bus. When it leaves on the dot at 430, nobody stops that bus. And no one gets in its way. But he's the guy that can do it. And he said, hold up, hold up. He went to the front of the bus, had somebody go get the kid's jersey. And he signed it, had it delivered back out there. And then we could go on to the game because uh, that was the last bus going to the arena for the 7 o'clock game. And to look through that window and to see that little kid's face, he was maybe 8, 9, 10 years old, to see that look. And he went from the dejection of not getting the autograph of his hero to getting it hand-delivered and to see the joy and just the elation on that kid's face uh that that's one moment i'll never forget and that's like sid in a nutshell he uh he just he gets it we always say he gets it and not many players would even have the wherewithal to see that he had missed a kid out there but he did and he went out of his way to make sure he got his autograph that is awesome <laughs> we we've only ever heard wonderful stories and it and that's why we we ask but it also has become such a theme uh, with it, it just so happened we had so many of our guests randomly unaffiliated with the Penguins having Sydney stories. So that's uh, our little background on that. Breezy, ask him the last one. Okay, this is totally not hockey related, so it's coming coming straight at you. But do you have a paranormal or an extraterrestrial story that you could share with us? No, but I am all in on these UFO stories right now. This is, I could go on. We could have our own show about these stories because it's in mainstream news now. I, I look at the New York Times the other day. It's front page news, and uh, we don't know. And I like to take that type of agnostic approach on a lot of these things that uh, we just don't know. And I think the, the government has said that now, that uh, the, the fact is we don't know what this tic-tac-shaped thing is that's flying and doing these crazy things. And uh, it's cool to think about, though. And uh, it really, you, you see my face just light up probably because I, I just am so intrigued by all the uh, the cosmos and uh, wondering what's out there. And, uh, I used to watch Unsolved Mysteries in the 90s, so I'm all in on this topic from when I was a kid. And Robert Stack would come out of the fog in his trench coat and he would have some UFO abduction <laughs> alien abduction story and uh yeah so for the younger viewers they can go on youtube and, and watch the clips of that <laughs> terrifying when you're like a 12 year old kid and you're watching those alien abduction stories on unsolved mysteries and in the mid 90s but um it was uh that was always something that, that fascinated me i don't have any personal story about ghosts or anything along those lines i wish i did i would like to think that if something along those lines existed with everyone having a camera in their pocket now, we'd have a little bit better footage of this stuff. Everyone has a camera, including pilots and people who fly in airplanes and people who are around haunted houses. So uh, I tend to lean toward uh, being more of a skeptic and I would like to think that we would have way more footage of all these things if, uh, if they were real. Good point. That's true. That's Very a true. good point. Well, <laughs> stay tuned for the end of June. The big report from the government comes out, which I'm sure you already know. And we are just, Breezy and I are just as excited to see what they actually publish in there because they can redact a lot. So, yeah, we'll see. But it, it, it's fun. You know, it's fun yeah. to think about. And it's fun with those alien stories from the 1940s and like some of the, some of the goofy 
uh, legends and the, the tall tales that have been told over the years. And uh, it's just a fun subject. And uh, I'm just interested in science and and uh, what goes on beyond our world. I think it's just so fascinating. So the fact that that discussion has come into the mainstream now and is not just like some wacky theory that's out there. And if you even mention it, you're just some goofball. I think it's, it's pretty cool that it's actually being discussed in the mainstream. Awesome. Well, Steve, thanks so much for your time. Tell everybody where they could keep up with you on your social media platforms of your choosing. And um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, Twitter, Mears the NHL, and uh, Instagram. It's uh, always fun to interact with various hockey fans from all over the world. It's uh, especially, they, I think a lot of people know me from NHL Network. If they're not Penguin fans, they would know me from other markets and just covering the, the sport in general. So it's uh, it's always great to interact with hockey fans, whether it's digitally or in person. And uh, yeah, if anybody's ever in Pittsburgh, uh, stop by. Like I said, I'm right there in the arena under normal circumstances, right in the crowd doing the games. So uh, always happy to talk hockey, and uh, I would invite anybody to come to Pittsburgh for either a Pirates, the Steelers, or a Penguins game because I think, I know I'm biased, but it's one of the great sports towns in America, and it's a part of the fabric here of this city where uh, everything is black and gold, and when the teams are good, everyone is all in here because uh, they just love their sports in western Pennsylvania. Thanks, Steve. So thank you so much. Thanks for coming over to our House of Hockey podcast and hanging out with us. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And in the meantime, you can follow us on social media. Just look for House of Hockey podcast. We'll be back next week.